I believe that after um, every service we have, we will not be the same. Every service, uh, we will not be the same. Why? Because we're preaching and teaching the word of God. And so we want you to be alert, always do something different in the Lord, always be uh, better than you were the week before in the Lord. You have to be because that's what the Spirit of God does to us and that's what is available to every single one of us is that the ability to have those things. Today we are reading from Matthew 5, Matthew 5, um, and the name of the, the service, uh, the message that we're given today is called Jesus Christ Has Answered. Can everybody say that? Say, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ has, answered. has answered. We talked last week about Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist uh, in, in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were there. All forms of God were there. All three aspects of who God is was there. Uh, and that was present with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is what we call the Trinity. Um, and this is when Jesus Christ's ministry began. His public ministry began with the same thing, his same words that, that were spoken by John the Baptist. He didn't change anything. He didn't make anything new. He simply revealed the same words that John the Baptist was saying. And that was Matthew. I want you to write that scripture down. Matthew 4, 17, when Jesus, the first thing he says is repent the kingdom of heaven is near. That's what he said. The word repent means sincere regret. You got to have sincere regret. How many people have apologized but truly didn't mean it before? Um, but how many people were hurt by something uh, that was within you or something that you did and when you apologized, you truly meant what you said. Whether the person responded uh, to you or not, you truly meant it. That is what repent is when he's saying repent, but the kingdom of heaven is near. And so repent means sincere regret, but the sincere regret is for everything that you have done wrong, all the sins that you have committed, even the things that you do not know that you have done wrong with God. You, The more you learn about him, the more you apologize and say, God, thank you for your grace. Amen. And so the first thing that Jesus said was repent, and then the second thing he says was the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven represents God's presence from heaven being brought to earth through Christ. And so the whole presence of who God is was brought to earth by who Christ was. And so that represents the hearts of the believers. That represents the actions of the believers being forgiven only through one, not through yourselves, but through Jesus Christ. And so the importance of Jesus Christ in the cross is large, I mean, is, is huge and large, which is large, in our lives. And so you've got to know uh, what this means, because you have to know that it's talking about believers, it's talking about all the, the people who've been saved, all the people who know God, and it's only through God that you know him. Amen. So you have to know that that's you that he's talking about when he says <coughs> repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. That was at that time. That was at that moment. That was before the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. He's telling them then, he's saying, repent. Look, all that you need is right here. And I, I have arrived. And so from that point, Jesus began his ministry. And you have to know what's going on at this time. Um, he began his ministry. He began to do three things. And I want you to write these things down. He began to teach the word of God. And the word of God are the words that come straight from him, which is from the Father. He began to call his disciples. The disciple, the word disciple, you have to know what that means. That's one who embraces the teachings of another. You know, so a disciple can be somebody who worships somebody else. It can be somebody who worships Satan. It can be somebody who worships, you know, their job. But a disciple is one who embraces the teachings of another. Of another. And so from that point, when Jesus began to teach his, uh, begin his ministry, he taught, 
He called his disciples and he began to heal those who were sick. Those are the three things he did in his ministry. And so he started with this beautiful thing called the Sermon on the Mount. And if you've ever, anybody ever heard of the Sermon on the yes. Mount? Uh, he began with the Sermon on the Mount and the first thing in the Sermon on the Mount was the Beatitudes. Everybody's familiar with the Beatitudes because if you're not, then you wasn't here on that day we went over in the <laughs> service. And so the Beatitudes um, was where he began to express the true meaning of blessing. See, a lot of us don't understand the true meaning of blessing before we went over the beatitude, but now you understand the true meaning of blessing because most people think that the true meaning of blessing is happiness. And you know, happiness is not the true meaning of blessing because happiness can be an outward view. I've got a lot of money, I'm happy. Anybody ever been there before? Amen. When you don't have a lot of money, you're sad. Anybody ever been there? And so the, uh, the true meaning of blessing is not the true meaning of blessing that we have in this world. It's the true meaning of blessing that we have in Christ. It's a, the outward feeling is what people normally typically think of as blessed. But Jesus Christ corrected that and making sure everybody who's a believer understand that blessing is an inward feeling because you share in the salvation that's not provided by you that you couldn't do anything to obtain. But God did everything for you to obtain it. That is the true meaning of blessed, blessedness. And these are the things that Jesus taught when he taught the Sermon on the Mount. And so it's um, so after Jesus gives this famous Sermon on the Mount, this is his inaugural ad address uh, where he continues uh, to, to explain to believers the direction, explain to believers what they should do, explain to believers how to do certain things like uh, he, he, he explained the true meaning of what murder is because the meaning of murder that they had is not the same meaning that, that Jesus had and so he wanted to correct everybody on what the true meaning of murder was, the true meaning of adultery. People said, oh man, that person's in adultery, we should stone that person and Jesus said, no, adultery is just, it's just looking at somebody in the wrong way and so Jesus made them understand that everybody is guilty of sin. And so he, he explained that and he explained the true meaning of divorce. He explained the true meaning of love and he explained the true meaning of prayer. He gave all of these things not to implement change because people mix this up. Jesus did not come to implement change amongst all the believers but to signify the fulfillment of the law. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to signify fulfillment of what we call the Pentateuch. Uh, that's the English word for, or for the Hebrew word that means Torah. Those are the five, first five books of the Bible. That is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. What is the next one? Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Let's say it again. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Those are the first five books of the Bible. Those are the books that the Old Testament uh, prophets and everybody, that's what they went off of. That's what they taught from. They taught from that Torah. They taught from that Hebrew, uh, Hebrew word Torah, and they taught everybody about, about uh, God, the Father. And so we are reading from Matthew 5.17. Matthew 5, 17. And this is where Jesus is confirming what he is to do here, what he, the purpose of him being here was. And so if you're a child of God, how many children of God do we have in here? Sincerely, how many children of God do we have in here this morning? If you're a child of God, don't you want to know what Jesus was confirming he was here to do? Of course you do. And so it is, it is your duty as a child of God to go through this scripture and don't just read it, but understand what God wants for you. Because the most important thing in walking with the Father is walking with the Son. There are a lot of people who say, I have a relationship with God, Amen. but they don't know Jesus. You cannot, it is impossible to have a relationship with the Father if you do not know the Son, because the Father and the Son are the same. Amen. So in order to know the Son, I mean the Father, you have to know the Son. You can't just read these things and take them like, uh, like you want to take them. You have to read them and take them for what they are. They're the same thing for me as they are for you. And so you have to read this from the right perspective. And so uh, we're reading from Matthew 5, 17, and this is where he's confirming what he is purposely here to do. And we're going to break this down here. Uh, Matthew 5, 17, the first thing it says is it says, 
do not think that you have come to abolish, or do not think that I have come to abolish the law of, or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, that is an important scripture here because you have to understand that Jesus is here giving his directives. He's sitting, he, you, and like I always tell you, read before and after. The Sermon on the Mount connects with what he's talking about here because he's still on the same mountain. He's still revealing the word of God. And this is what he's telling us. He's saying, I am not here to abolish the law of the prophets, but I'm here to accomplish them, to fulfill the laws of the prophets and the laws of the, the Old Testament. And so what he's saying here, Jesus Christ, he fulfilled the law by giving them full meaning. And so, you know, a lot of times people don't understand what, what he's talking about here. He's talking about fulfilling the law by completing it. There's one thing to say you can't do something, but there's another thing to say you can't do something and explain it to you so that you know completely what you cannot do. Jesus here is explaining the laws that he gave them years ago so that they can understand the true meaning of the law. And it, mean, it meant the same when Jesus was on this earth and it meant the same when he first gave them to Moses. You see what I'm saying? It's the same law, but now he's confirming it so it's easier to understand for everybody and not going by what the, 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 the other people taught them. And so this is what he said. He said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, he, he gives them full meaning and he gives them the internal version of what the law is. There's an external version. An external version is God says not to do this. I'm just not going to do it because he says not to. Not you're not going to do it because you love God. But you're not going to do it because he says not to and he's God and he runs everything. You see, the internal version is, is, is understanding that who Jesus is truly and taking away the superficial version that the Pharisees had. The superficial version is what they were giving to everybody. And I want to give you an example of the superficial version. Uh, write this scripture down, Leviticus. Uh, 2730 that that talks about tithe and it says a tithe of everything from the land belongs to the Lord and so the the Pharisees took that they preached that word and they enforced that law but they ignored the spiritual part of that law which makes us cheerful givers see if you understood your love for God if you understood what God does for you if you understood who God is if you understood the relationship that he wants for you then you understood that all the money that you have is because of him anyway and so what they taught is you must give this tithe. You must give this. You must do this. And Jesus is saying, no, you have to be cheerful givers. The only reason you would give in the first place is because I put it upon your heart. Not because they're saying you want, you have to do something. And so there were people given who did not even know the Lord. There were people given who did not know God. There were Pharisees who gave and, and thought they were accomplishing stuff because they gave. And God says, no, it's a cheerful giver. It's somebody who I put upon their heart to give, not somebody who gives for a reward. <laughs> so Leviticus 27 talks about that. It talks about the, uh, the tithe of everything from the land. That, and then the scripture says it belongs to the Lord, not you should give it to the Lord. It says it belongs to the Lord, which they, they established from that point forward is that Jesus was uh, changing everything. He was changing the way they thought of him because they looked at him from a different standpoint. And if you don't understand, you understand that God in the flesh was the same God that gave them the commandments. Do you understand that? Amen. It's the same God, same God. And so the enforcement gave the impression that righteousness can be obtained by works. And how many people know in here that we operate on grace? Amen. Did you know that technically they operated on grace also if they had accepted it? The, the purpose of those laws was to identify sin and to give them direction on what to do and what not to do. And um, the enforcement, what it did, it gave them impression that I can give all my money and know God for the rest of my life. I, and how many people know that there are people who've given money for years and years and still don't have a good heart yeah. or a, a good form of righteousness within them? They still curse. They still do all the bad things. They do not. It's evident that they do not walk with God. 
And this is the same thing they're talking about with the, the, the prophets and with the men of God back in the day. They used to say, some people used to say things and some people used to do things and some people used to be about who oh, God was. Amen. There is a difference. And so the enforcement gave the impression that righteousness can be attained by works. And what Jesus came here to do was to correct that. He came him here to correct that, that it was and it is only by faith in him that you obtain righteousness. That's it. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. And so he's saying it's only through him. He's correcting it. He's not changing the Old Testament scripture. He's correcting it and giving them the complete understanding of what he meant when he gave them scripture years and years ago. And so I want to continue to read this. It says, verse 18, For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, I wanted to break this down because you have to understand what it's talking about when it says smallest letter. The smallest letter, the Greek in the Greek text, this same word means this word, iota. Anybody ever heard that word iota? Anybody ever heard that word iota? Some of y'all have used that. This is, iota is the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet. It's the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet. So anybody who ever said the, who ever said the thing uh, of that person hadn't given me not one iota of help. Have you ever said something like that? Have you ever used the word iota? Then you understand that what you're using is you're saying they haven't given me the littlest bit of help. They haven't given me any help. Well, you're using a word that's technically from the Bible. And sometimes we don't realize that the, 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 the terms that we use are from the Bible. And so that word is the represents the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet, and that's the word iota. And so verse 19, we want to continue to read from this. Verse 19 says this. So, so Jesus is saying, the, you know, in general, he's saying, until heavens disappear, not the smallest um, smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything has been accomplished. And I want to read 19. It says, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called the great, the great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, what is the, the meaning of that? It means that these words were given. These laws were given by God. And if they're given by God, they needed to be followed by man. They're simple laws. The problem, the reason people didn't want to follow the laws is because they didn't understand the laws. And Jesus said, these laws simply operate off of love. If you operate off of love, all these laws are followed anyway. You, you think about the next person. You care about the next person. You're concerned about the next person. You help out the next person. You help your neighbor. You love your neighbor as yourself. And you love God because you know God is love. And the reason you have love is because of God who is love. Amen. So these words, these laws were given by God. To set laws aside and say, I'm not going to listen to the law, means that you're not just setting the law aside, you're setting the God aside who created the law. And so if you set God aside, you're saying, I'm just ignoring God because he gives me this law, but I don't want to follow this law because my flesh says I shouldn't follow this law, which means you're just saying, I God, I don't want to follow you. And so that's why he's saying, if you don't operate just the least bit, if you do, if you ignore the least bit of this, you will be the smallest in the kingdom of heaven. And so God is trying to take us in the right direction. And so the, anybody who objects these laws objects God. And you have to know that at this time, they were still bound by the law. Because before Jesus died and was buried and resurrected, all of these people had to operate according to the law still. And so that's why Jesus is saying, you have to still follow every iota of these laws. Every law has to be followed according to the scripture and what it says. 
And so Jesus was giving this and telling them that they were, you know, they were basically still bound by these laws. And you remember that the only way they were unbound by the law is when Jesus died. Right. And Jesus had not yet died. And so he, because he had not yet died, they were still under the law. Now I want to read verse 20 to you. Verse 20 says this. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses the Pharisees and, and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you know nothing about the Pharisees, then you think you have to be as wise as a Pharisee. And he's actually talking about the opposite. The Pharisees were superficial people. They thought everything they did get brought them closer to God. And they were thinking as everybody else, looking at everybody else and thinking of them as little people. And so they think, we are the teachers of the law. You should follow it because we're teaching it this way. And the true meaning of scripture and understanding scripture is not what pastor teaches, but what God says. Amen. You have to understand it is what God says because he'll say the same thing to me that he says to you in your reading. If you understand the scripture, it means the same. And so if you understand what they're saying here, he's saying that the Pharisees were fake. The Pharisees were not real. The Sadducees were fake. The Sadducees were not real. These were the people who taught the law. These people taught the law over and over again. And Jesus said, I'm going to go down and break this down because every single law I've given them, all these laws, they're taking it in a different direction. And they've created their own laws. So that's why it looks so different when he says, I am here to fulfill the law. I am here to fulfill the purpose. I am here to completely make you understand what I'm saying and what I said when I gave you all the laws years and years ago. So the Pharisees, you have to understand the, 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 dif the difference of the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they were a legalistic group. That's all they taught. They were a legalistic group and they, you know, um, they went strictly uh, by keeping the law. Everything they focused on was keeping the law. Uh, every iota was keeping the law. All they're focusing was the law says this, this is what we're going to do. And when you do that like that, when you say the law is this, and you say Jesus said it, therefore I'm going to do it that way, instead of uh, operating in love and what he meant truly for us, when you operate and say the law says this, we're going to do it this way, you know what that does? That makes you just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't operate in love. They didn't operate in their spiritual love with God. They operated in their fleshly uh, love for what the word says. It says it this way, and it lifted them up to make them think that they were at a higher standard than everybody else. This is what happens to us as Christians. When we lift up the word and make us think we're better than everybody else. The moment I think I'm better than you, the moment I lift up a standard and think you can't do it because I'm the deal and you're not is the moment I become a Pharisee just like Jesus was talking about. Amen. The moment you do the same thing, the moment you think you know more word than everybody else and you can teach it better than anybody else is the moment you become legalistic just like they became. Everything should be about love. You should love somebody enough to want to teach them the word, not teach them the word because you know it so well. Uh-huh. Amen. Amen. So, this is what's happening. The Pharisees, they were a legalistic group. And Jesus, when he said this, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, what he's doing is he's saying the Pharisees that y'all think are all that are really not that at all. They don't truly know me because if they knew me, they would operate in love. They, they don't truly know me because they wouldn't bring it to me and say, Yo, well, we should kill this woman. And Jesus said, well, let he without sin cast the first stone and throw that in their faces. They would have known before they even came to Jesus how to operate with a woman who operated in sin. So the, the Pharisees kept the law. They lifted themselves up and they missed the true purpose of God. And what I'm asking you, what I'm explaining to you this morning is not to ever lift yourself up in this word. The word is what lifts you up. Amen. The word is what makes you better. The word, and the, the better the word makes you, the more humble you become. Amen. And so you, it's not a person with a robe on who's a bishop who has all these scholars and this now theological, you know, whatever, uh, in, in, in Bible study and all this other stuff. And, they forget who they are in Christ. And what Jesus was saying is that love is for everybody. 
We're supposed to operate in love. We're supposed to respond in love. The littlest person is the greatest person in the kingdom. What does that mean? That means that it's my most important thing to make sure the person who doesn't want, who wants to know about God, who's uh, striving for God, who's striving to learn more about the word, make sure that they understand the word correctly, not run away from them. And so us as Christians, we can operate as Pharisees when we begin to think that we're all that and we miss the true purpose of God. How many people know what the reason Satan was thrown out of heaven once? It's because he got so much of God that he thought he was God. And when he thought he was God, God humbled him and threw him out and said, no, I am God in the end. And so you have to understand that none of us are God, only he is. We're just vessels who spread his word. So the Pharisees were self-righteous. <laughs> and that's what Jesus was chipping at when he said that. And said, uh, so as long as believers, righteousness surpass the Pharisees' righteousness, we're good. And the Pharisees' righteousness wasn't righteousness. It was self-righteousness. And so as long as you remain humble in love the Lord, as long as you're always willing to learn, as long as you know no matter who's teaching the word of God, if they're teaching the right word of God, you are going to learn something, then you go from self-righteousness to the righteousness of God. Amen. So they, what does that mean for us as believers now? Because every message in here has, has a message for them then, and it has a message for us now. So what is the message for us as believers now? You have to know, I mean, is it that Jesus Christ will answer your situation? Is it Jesus Christ will answer? We, are we waiting for Jesus to finish something? Or has he already finished something? Or uh, is it Jesus Christ can answer something? Can he fulfill the law? No, he's already fulfilled the law. The true meaning is that Jesus Christ has answered he has already done everything that was needed to be done for you to receive your righteousness. What do you have to do from there? Follow him. That's it. The purpose of us being here is not just to sit in the scripture and, and go over the scripture. The purpose is for you to learn and apply it to your life. If you're just learning it, you're not applying it to your life, then it does nothing for you. The moment you start to apply forgiveness, the moment you start to apply love, the moment you start to apply redemption from jealousy and walk, walking away from envy and all those things, strife and all that other stuff, the moment you start to apply it is the moment God comes down and rains upon you all his Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is what got you here. The Holy Spirit is what got you here and uh, is the only thing that makes you say hallelujah. But he expects you to allow him to work. He's not going to force himself upon you. He's going to allow, you have to allow him to work. How do you allow him to work? The moment you let go of something, he takes something out of you. Amen. The kingdom of God. Because we have to know that Jesus Christ has already answered everything we can possibly think of. Everything. Everything you, everything you need is in this word. And sometimes you have to go to others because you're not looking in the word. You see, the others are not your word. The word is right here. You have to read it for yourself and you have to apply it to your life in everything you do. Forgiveness. How many people have learned to forgive yet? How many people are mad right now? Soaking. Right now in anger. Right now. For something. That's fleshly. Has anybody ever experienced that? Anybody? Yes. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> the king, that you have to know that Jesus Christ has already answered every possible thing that could happen in our lives. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, eternal life, all these things that we obtain was a free gift from God. There's absolutely nothing you can do to get closer to God or nothing you can do to get further away from God. But the more you learn about God, the more Jesus Christ works in your life. The less you learn about God, the more you get angry at silly stuff. The more you get jealous over everything. The more you have wrath when somebody does you wrong. The more you think about bitterness. The more you think about envy. Because you operate in your flesh instead of your spirit. Your spirit is only in 
this word of God. And so the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, which is the same thing, eternal life, which is the same thing, is a gift of the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. It's not a gift of the Father to you. It's a gift of the Father to you through Christ. The only way you get that gift is through Christ. The only way you get stronger is through Christ. How many people in here have ever said, I want to be stronger in God? Amen. If you read less, you, are not, you don't become as strong as you want to become. You read more, you become more strong. You read in the middle, you have the middle strength. How many people truly want to be strong in God? You can't say, I want to be stronger in God, but I will not go to Bible study. You cannot say, I will, I want to be stronger in God, but I will not read the word. You cannot say, I want to be stronger in God, but I will not lift my hands in prayer. You cannot say that. The only way to become stronger in God is to worship God. The only way to worship God is to read his word. The only way to read his word is to know who you are in Christ. To do any less is to receive less. Amen. To do more is to receive more. The more you want of God, the more you desire the things of God. We talked earlier about understanding that years ago we listened to the rap music. Some of y'all still listen to it. Do you know that that's operating in your flesh every time you listen to that? You're feeding your flesh, not your spirit. You say, I have to listen to that. I have to listen to that. Well, yes, because you're feeding your flesh. Because your flesh is hungry. Oh. The more you, you see, I, I, you know, I was talking to my brother in Christ about, uh, you know, we were listening, we were talking about the different stations we listened to, and I was talking about years ago, how I used to listen to these stations, and then I, uh, somebody introduced me to K-Love, and I was like, what, whatever, you know, I turned it on, like, I can't get with this, how many people have said that before? Amen. You say, I can't get with this, I don't know what's going on, I can't, I just can't listen to this. You know why? Because you're operating in your flesh when you say that. And then you get to the point years later where you say, I can't turn it off. How many people said that before? Amen. You know why you said that? Because you're operating in your spirit now. You should give God glory because the only reason you're there is because of God. He does the mighty change in you. And so anything that you put before God, you say, I'm going to remain in my anger. That's because you're operating in your flesh. When you get to the point where you say, anger is overrated, I'm going to let it go. Now you're operating in your spirit. Yes. Yes. I'm going to remain, resent, I'm going to resent that person for what they did to me. You're remaining in your anger. Right. I'm going to res uh, love that person in spite of what they've done for me. You're operating in your, your spirit. You have to know that God puts you in that test. Why? Because he knows that sooner or later you're going to give in to your spirit, but right now you're giving in to your flesh. Amen. <clears throat> Jesus Christ has already answered every single thing we can possibly think of. It is all in this word. You either choose to apply it or you choose to resist it. The longer you resist, the less you apply. It's real simple. The, the, the longer it took me to get over anger and bitterness uh, was the faster I, I chose not to read. I, I, just, I just resisted reading. I resisted listening to the word. I resisted going to church. I resisted doing all those things. You know why? Because the, the, the spirit of God was not working in me. But when I said, man, you know what? I'm through. I'm going to start reading. And then God put me on this plan and I started reading. You know what happened? Change happened in my life. Amen. Why? Because I accepted God. Amen. And you, I'm telling you, between the ages of 19 and 24 is when our minds are still developing. Come on. Do you understand that? 19 to 24. So if, if, if somebody had told me that when I was young, I would have understood that from 19 to 24, I realized I know nothing. Come on. But 19 to 24 is when we think we know everything. I just want to help you all out with that. That's free. That's free because that's when I thought I know everything. How many people have been there? You thought you knew everything from 19 to 24. You were the deal. You knew everything. You had every answer. And then at 24, you said, man, I don't know nothing. <laughs> I absolutely know nothing. And then you realize that the work of God works in your life. And so you have to know that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, eternal life, all these things are just gifts of God through his son, Jesus Christ. It's given to us by his grace as his people. And it was given to us before the creation of the world. We were chosen. That's Ephesians 1.4. And so Amen. if you know that you were chosen before the creation of the world to know God, you might want to start getting over your bitterness and anger and envy and all that stuff now. Amen. Because if you, you, the quickest way to the back wall is straight. The quickest way to the front is straight. 
If, if you want to take these avenues to the left and to the right, that's fine. That's fine. But you'll still end up in the right place. That's right. The point is, if you want to get there faster, Jesus said that life is in Christ. Death is in your, your flesh. If life is in Christ and death is in your flesh, that's called a clue. Light bulb should come on to how you get better in your life. You get better in your life through Christ. And nothing else gives you life. Nothing else gives you happiness. You can have all the money in the world, but if you were an idiot when you were broke, you will be an idiot when you're rich. <laughs> so the wisdom comes through God. And you have to know that we were chosen before the creation of the world. And so the best thing we can do as a grace supplied vessel, complement of the Father, is listen to the Son and follow his ways. Amen. The simple process to this is just deciding to listen to God. Don't listen to anybody else. Listen to God. Let him work through you. He works through you by working through people around you. If what they're saying is not scriptural, don't listen to them. It's not our own way like the Pharisees and the Sadducees did it, but it's his way. Amen. Look, he created us. We didn't create ourselves. He created us. Look, the anger you have in your heart right now, he allowed you to have it. When you have bitterness, he allowed you to have it. But he also created love. And he says, if you operate in love, you operate in life. If you operate in anger and bitterness, you give the devil power over your life. Nobody else should be able to make you mad Amen. ever again. Amen. Because you're operating spiritual. When you operate fleshly, things around you affect you. And you know what that means? That everything around you controls you. And until we learn to allow the spirit to control us, things may shift us in the wrong direction. We may get angry for a moment. We may be angry in the, in the, in the, in the spur of the moment. But joy comes in the morning when we give God glory. You may be mad at somebody in the evening, but you say, no, I'm forgetting about that. I'm allowing God to work in my life. That is the most important thing for us. When you allow God to work in your life, God says, okay, he has passed that test. Let me get him to the next test. God didn't say things wouldn't happen. He said that when they happen, Jesus has already answered what you need in your life. So from this day forward, give God glory. It's not on your own. It's not your own way. That's what the Pharisees did. They created their own mind. They said, God gives us these laws. We're going to follow these laws. Jesus said, you follow the laws, but left the spirit out. So for us, do your due diligence on what God is saying. Understand the scripture. If you need this church, don't go to another church and, and just go because they look good. Pre-qualify them. You are a child of God. You're supposed to be in a, in a child of God's church. Pre-qualify them and make sure that they operate with the answer that is only given through Christ. Because Jesus Christ has answered. He's already done everything you can, you can uh, expect in your life. He's already given you everything that you need, and it goes in this world. And if you truly believe, if you truly trust, you can't say, I believe, but you don't read. How can you say, I believe in God, but I haven't read any of his scripture? I love God the Father, but I haven't accepted his son. I accept God's son, but I haven't read his word. You have to read his word. And here's the thing. Your flesh crawls and tries to creep, keep you from reading. You know why? Because that gives the devil power over your life. You want to take away the power of the devil? Let your flesh submit to your spirit and read his word. You got to simply say, no matter what, no matter what's going on in my life, no matter how weak I feel at that moment, when I am weak, he is strong. You got to be able to read the scripture. You got to know that only Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of your faith. Amen. There will be times when you will be weak. He didn't say you wouldn't be weak. He said that when you are, he's strong. You've got to learn how to be insane for Christ. You've got to learn how to know he's answered. You've got to learn how to know that when I'm weak, oh, man, I'm feeling weak. I don't feel like reading. Oh, wow, that means I need to read. Amen. 
oh man, I don't feel like listening to this music. Oh man, that means I need to click it on. When you do insane things like that, you know that Jesus Christ has answered. Amen. Can you stand to your feet and give God glory in the house this morning? Yes. Amen. Amen.